Welcome, everybody. Um, I am Robert Piggott. I am the Global Technical Manager for um, Lalamond Biofuels and Distilled Spirits and, and Craft Distilling. I'm here to give you an overview on the production of rum and rum. So without further ado, let's, let's get started here. Just a very quick thing on just where we are and who we are. Lalamond is a private Canadian company uh, founded over a century ago. We have 12 business units, as you can see on the attached picture. And we've got more than 4,000 employees in 45 countries and five continents. Um, the main ones that you'd be interested in, biofuels and distilled spirits, which we are a, a part of. Who are we? We are an international team working locally. This just gives you some idea of where we are based. Um, North America, Canada, East Coast, West Coast, Europe, India, Asia, Thailand, Australia. So we're around the world. We can give you uh, local contacts to help you with your issues or when you have anything you want to discuss. We work as a team. And one thing we sell with our products is support. We support fermentation, troubleshooting, research and development, sensory evaluation. We do education as with this or with the Alcohol School Craft Distilling Seminar. Uh, our products, yeast, nutrients, enzymes, bacteria, and we develop partnerships. We develop partnerships and we work together to help you produce the spirit that you want. So quick overview, outline, definition of rum, rum agricole, what is it? Overview of the process, rum for molasses, which is I think more pertinent to yourselves, overview of the process and diversity of the distillation of molasses rum and a little on the impact of aging. So first of all, what is rum? Rum is probably the most diverse spirit that you can get. Um, it goes from ultra light, not quite vodka, all the way to heavy, dark rums that you can sit by your, your fire and just, just drink by themselves. So it's a very diverse spirit with a lot of different characters, a lot of different flavor profiles. So, and each area has its own definition of rum, but they are generally speaking, fairly consistent. And you've really just got to remember two things. First, it has to come from cane. Uh, you cannot make rum from beet molasses or beet juice. It has to come from cane and it has to have uh, the organoleptic characteristics or profile uh, of, from the fermentation that are usually associated with rum. So it's got to have some flavor and it's got to taste or sm and smell like rum in effect. The rest, there's some little bits and pieces, but those are the two main parts you must remember for what rum is. So let's start rum from fresh cane juice. This probably is not very relevant to yourselves, but it is very important to understand that there are two big types of rum, uh, rum from juice and rum from molasses, which are very, very, very different. And of all the rum produced in the world, it's about 50-50. And the big part of that is the Brazilian cachaça is made, made with juice, so um, it's about 50-50 in the production. I've chosen rum agricole because as a production process, it is more defined and more consistent than cachaça. So, um, and I've chosen the sort of French spelling of rum just to differentiate the two. Um, rum agricole is produced in the French overseas territories, Madeira and Mauritius. But there are other countries, like I said, that um, use juice. Uh, fermentation must be from fresh sugarcane juice exclusively. 
We can't use molasses. Um, in order to get this, the cane has to be clean uh, and fresh. You want to cut that cane, preferably the, the day, the, uh, the, the most the day before um, you, you crush it. You don't want to leave cane lying around in a truck or in the field for a couple of days before you try and uh, process it. Um, it's obviously very rich in sugar. Harvest in the Caribbean, uh, February to June. So the thing about juice, it cannot be stored. L unlike molasses, you can't store it. It's got to be used fresh straight away. So you can only make it during the crush season. Um, yield, we get about 75 tons of cane per hectare. And our final alcohol concentration is 5 to 6%. So quite low. Here, here is the process. We come in, your, your cane is conveyed and it goes through three, sometimes four crushers. Uh, basically all these are rollers that crush the cane. You also put some water in there to help wash the sugar juice out. The gas after the crushers goes into the boiler where it's burned to generate steam. The juice comes down, it is collected. Usually it goes through some sort of filter to get out the lumps of cane, et cetera, that come through. Um, this, this juice then goes into your fermenters. Since this is a basically a sugar solution with a lot of uh, bacteria and wild yeast that comes off the crushers, et cetera, it's very important that we get this going very, very quickly. So we usually pre-start the yeast. The yeast is going and it's going when it goes into that fermenter. So it's a very quick fermentation just so that we get the flavor profile that we want. The other interesting thing about the rum agricole fermenters, they are usually open topped. They are very seldom closed. After, after the fermentation, fermentation is, is quite short, uh, 24 to 30, 30 hours normally before it is pumped. We then go in, it then comes out into the distillation through a preheater, it's done with a continuous distillation. It, uh, there's actually some minimums. You gotta have a minimum of 15 trays on the stripping section and a minimum of five trays on the concentrating section. And then we come out of there at uh, less than 80, but in your 70% alcohol range in that flavor percent flavor area that you want because rum agricole just the same as cachaca has minimum levels of congeners you must have in your spirit so we take this off at a, a lower strength normally in the 70 70 percent range there are some rules about that and from there it goes either uh, to producing white rum or into aging for aged rum. Now, this is just to give you a different idea of what the yeast does for you. So um, this is five different rum yeast. And as you can see, what we've done here is just give you a selection of mostly esters, um, a couple of alcohols, just to give you an idea of what is produced. So as you can see, uh, strain uh, three versus strain one, there's a huge difference in your flavor profile. So what this does, it shows you your, the strain of yeast that you use has a very big impact on your flavor profile. Uh, 
just another quick one on the distillation. As you can see, you, you come in, you go through your vapors, preheat the the wine wine going into the into the still. Finesse comes out the bottom. Uh, your product comes out the top. Quite simple, like I said, ethanol content generally in the 45, 70% range. Um, that's, if you wanted a flavored spirit, almost any spirit, that's, that's probably a good range to shoot for if you are, have a continuous still that you can control that temperature range. Um, most of you don't, but it's, that's a good range to be in. Now on to some rum from molasses. First of all, we've got to look at where this molasses comes from. Very complex pictogram here. Um, but what we need to look at is various parts of this process. Now, we come on the crushing, et cetera, is almost the same except on a much bigger scale. You see, we have the first set of, we go through a clarification stage here, and then it goes through an evaporation stage. This really just concentrates the juice up. This is rough, generally speaking, where we take high test molasses. This is molasses where no sugar has been removed and there's very little Maillard reaction taking place. So it's quite a light, light liquid that comes off. It is also very, very different to handle than your normal uh, dark molasses. So just remember, if you're using high test molasses, it's very different. Um, it then goes into three sets of crystallization. It then, that then comes off into sugar. Well, into muscat, it's turned into sugar. It's actually a fairly brown sugar. Um, the liquid after that third crystallization, that is your molasses. That is your sea molasses or blackstrap molasses. This molasses, as you will see later, varies a lot in quality. Um, it is generally treated by the sugar plant as effluent. So you will get, when you buy molasses, all the problems with the operator falling asleep at three o'clock in the morning, uh, engineers trying to improve the process, change the process. This will all come out in, in your blackstrap molasses. So you can see why there is all this variability in there. The other thing that you will sometimes see on the market is what, what I call refiner's molasses, sometimes called fancy molasses. Um, but it's something you, if you're a small producer, you may see more often. Um, what they do is, as you can see, the sugar coming off here is a light brown color. Um, very, very nice sugar, actually. But in order to make white sugar, they redissolve this and recrystallize it. Then they will redissolve, and they will do this about eight times with different lots. The molasses they get off that recrystallization stage is what's called refiner's molasses or sometimes fancy molasses. Again, very, very different than either high test molasses or blackstrap molasses. The fermentation is completely different. Your feedstock uh, mineral content is totally different. If you're running either particularly uh, refiner's molasses, fancy molasses, or um, high test molasses, be sure you talk to your yeast supplier 
about it because the actual process is quite is quite different. Just to give you an idea of blackstrap, which is the most common that's made used for rum around the world. I made rum in the Caribbean with blackstrap for many years. Um, all this is meant to do is just give you some idea of the variability you see. Um, bricks should be 80 to 85, generally speaking. If you start getting above that, generally you've got uh, a lot of Maillard reaction components in there which aren't fermentable. Uh, normally the darker your molasses, the poorer your quality. Total sugar says invert. This is a standard measure in the sugar industry, but it is not fermentable sugars. It's really the reducing compounds that are present in the molasses. And as you will see, if you look at fermentable sugars, the fermentable total sugars is inferred are usually about six, and it can be from four to eight, even maybe even higher, lower, fermentable, lower than the total sugars is invert. That's important. Some people take the total sugars as invert and think they're all fermentable and they're not. Ash, always a problem. Like I said, as you can see from the process, all the ash, et cetera, comes through. While it varies a lot, it can bug up your stills and your fermentation no end. pH, normally fairly good. Your wash, generally speaking, when you dilute, it should be in the range uh, 5.48 to 5.2. Very good range for uh, fermentation. Uh, your fermentable uh, sugar ratio to literally other ratio. Normally, the, the lower this ratio, the better off you are. Um, Volatile acids, you always see these in your spirit. Obviously, the lower, the better. Particularly, as you sort of can see here, um, in India, if you get Indian molasses or some of the African or South American molasses, these plants are not particularly sanitary, shall we say. So often the volatile acids can be very high. These will affect your fermentation. Uh, total inorganic matter, as you can see, varies a lot. Generally speaking, not that much, but you will get gums, et cetera, which will drop out during your fermentation. So uh, total sugar content of blackstrap molasses, uh, 45 to 52 percent. That's total sugars. It's invert. Um, total sugars, fermentable sugars, are usually about 40 to about 46 percent. If you just take my figure, I normally use for fermentable sugars. If I have no data to base it on, I use I use 46 percent. Um, as you crystallize. As you will appreciate, you degrade the molasses. You have that Maillard reaction going on, and it turns your proteins and your sugars into unfermentable compounds. There's nothing you can do about this, but being the Maillard reaction, it turns the molasses darker. So, like I said earlier on, generally, the darker your molasses, the poorer the quality is for fermentation. And due to the high amount of salts and non-fermentable solids, um, you have one, high osmotic stress on your yeast. This is something you need to be aware of when you're going. That is what controls, generally speaking, how high you can push the alcohol content in your fermentations. We have ways around this, well, not totally around it, but ways to help mitigate that osmotic stress. 
but again, you must be aware of this. You just can't throw a whole bunch of molasses in some water and some yeast and think it's going to ferment well. It won't necessarily be like that. And um, all these, uh, particularly the calcium that's in there, that'll coat out in your distillation if you're not careful. And you will end up having to clean your stills on a fairly regular basis. OK, so here, here is the process for doing rum from molasses. Basically, three basic components, water, yeast, and molasses. We normally have to add also in there uh, some, some nutrition because of this, the Maillard reaction happening, unlike with juice, we normally at least have to add some amino nitrogen, sometimes um, some other, other, because the mineral content is unbalanced, we, we normally work with balancing the mineral profile as well, which is one of the ways, as I mentioned earlier, we can help alleviate some of the osmotic stress in there. We then put this in. It's a fairly quick fermentation as opposed to a starch fermentation. Uh, but again, if you want to get into your 12% alcohol range, you're, you're still up around 40 to 50 hours. But the conditions here in fermentation are critical to your flavor development. While the flavor comes out in aging, in distillation, most of the components, the raw basic parts of your flavor are formed in, that fer in the fermentation. Distillation, generally, we can uh, create some esters, remove, but most of it is removal of unwanted flavors rather than adding flavors. So we then go into, yeah, we're in the distillation phase. It can be uh, batch distillation or continuous fermentation. And again, it depends what we want to take out and what we want to leave in. We then go into match maturation and aging. This is a big difference that you would see if you are making rum in a cooler country uh, as opposed to a tropical country. Aging in the tropical country like the Caribbean, uh, because of the temperature where your probably average temperature is 30 degrees, uh, parts of this happen much, much faster, as you will see later on, in the warm country, true chemical reactions are, generally speaking, three times faster than in a cooler climate, whereas a lot of your wood extraction flavors are roughly about the same. So aging is a critical part of, of flavor development if you're making an aged spirit. If you are just making a light white rum, of course, it's straight off distillation, uh, broken down and bottled unless you're in Canada where you have to keep it for a year. Fermentation. What happens here, of course, is your yeast converts the sugars and some of your amino acids are brought into here as well, into alcohol, energy, carbon dioxide, and congeners. Now the congeners, while they are the flavor component of this, actually make up less than 1% of the final, final product, much less. But there are over 400 congeners that have been found in rum. So again, very important to get your conditions right in the fermentation. Um, like I said, they generate your aromas and flavor profiles and different yeasts, again, will provide a different flavor. This is just to give you some idea of what the difference is in various yeast. Now on this graph, the black line, which you can see fairly prominently here 
um, it's just a control, just so we have something to compare all the different yeast to. So as you can see, you have some yeast that ferment very slowly. They, um, some don't even complete. We have moderately fermenting yeast and we have fast fermenting yeast. Normally, this is where we want to be. Uh, because of the way rum is produced, you, you, you want to get that flavor profile fairly quickly with a short lag phase here. Sometimes one of, some of your moderately fermenting yeast may be what you want. Then I said the slow ones you don't want. But again, we dedicate our yeast to our feedstock. The other part of this is not just what you put in and what the sugar content is, it is also temperature. As I've been mentioning frequently throughout this, rum is usually made in a warm climate. So our fermentation temperatures are normally 33 to 35 degrees. That's what we normally ferment. So again, what you're looking for is a, a yeast which has the flavor profile you want that works in that temperature range. So as you can see, just two different yeasts here, strain A and strain B. Um, the ester profile in strain B doesn't vary a lot between uh, 20 and 30 degrees. It, it's fairly consistent. Whereas you can see strain A varies quite considerably in the difference between the two, two temperatures. Now, all yeast, generally speaking, has a temperature range in which it produces the, the best flavors. Generally, with molasses yeast, that is a little bit on the the warm side, um, again, uh, because most of the fermentations are, are done warm in, in the sort of 30 degree range. So that is generally, if you're using a rum yeast and if you can ferment in the 30 degree range, it will generally give you the best balanced flavors. However, if you don't, if you're fermenting cool, you need a strain like A, which does generate more flavors in the cooler fermentation. These are exactly the same yeast as you saw previously. So as you can see, again, your flavor profile varies considerably with your yeast. These fermentations, as far as I can remember, were all done at 33 degrees. But if you've got a good memory, you will also remember uh, that some of these charts look very different from the same yeast, which I showed you on juice. And to, to highlight this, this is strain two, and it's strain two done on molasses and strain two done on fresh cane juice. As you can see, they are very, very different. And so again, what flavor you get depends on your feedstock, um, how you handle your feedstock, particularly with molasses. Juice, you don't have a lot of choice in. Molasses, yes, you, you've got a lot of flexibility in how you handle it. That's very important. But also the yeast is critical to get the flavor profile you want. Distillation. These I picked up from my time in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, it's still type that's very common there uh, is the Adam still. It developed, I think it was about 1810, if I remember correctly. Um, but what it is, it's a triple re retort still. So what happens is you get sort of three distillations in one batch. It comes over, you get some condensed liquid here, so it bubbles through that. Your vapor from there is enriched, it comes through that, it comes out and it's cooled down. Very, very common out there. And you get about a 75%, 80% alcohol strength coming off with the one, one distillation. Um, 
historically, this is a very common still in the Caribbean and um, a lot of our rums. Now, there's two, two here, Appleton and Mount Gay. I think those will be known to you. Appleton, of course, from Jamaica, Mount Gay from Barbados. And so as you can see, the basically the triple retort still. Um, a cup, I mean, while they look similar, they are run differently. Appleton runs a much faster distillation. They push it through much, much quicker than Mount Gay. And Mount Gay uses a worm cooler, whereas Appleton uses a shell and tube. Um, so again, you get very different, but spirits off these, but this is a, a very typical batch Caribbean distillation. The other one that is very common in flavored rum production is your two column still, continuous still. Now, what you'll see here, I have divided up into two columns. Often you will see the second column actually is on top of the first column, which is roughly what you saw in the rum agricole production. You saw your stripping column literally on top of your stripping column. Um, the advantage that you've got with, with this is you draw a continuous product out all the time and you have much tighter control on your flavor profile. Because what you do is means that during the run, you're continually drawing off your head's character, uh, propanol, fusel oil character as we're running. Now, what a lot of the distillers do with the same still, they can make several different marks with the same still. And they do that even though the feedstock to the still is the same by varying the draws, particularly of your fusel oil and your heads. So you can leave increasing or less fusel oil or heads in the process. So that is generally how you get the same feedstock going in, but a completely different flavor profile coming out. So that's, that's also a very common way to do it, particularly if you, you go into uh, Guyanese rum, uh, some of the Jamaican rums and the Bayesian rums. Of course, if you're making a very light rum, you normally go with a three column distillation where you also have an extractive distillation column to remove some of the more of the flavor. Rum maturation. Maturation, development of color, fragrance, mellowness, complexity in the cat during storage, exactly the same, same as whiskey, except the, the flavor profile is different. There are some regulations regarding aging time that varies from country to country. And what you've also got to remember is uh, particularly some of the Spanish uh, style rums, they are done with a Solera type system. So you cannot in theory have age statements on there. Um, Others, particularly in the, the British Caribbean, use exactly the same rules as for Scots or anything else when it comes to aging. Any age statement must be of the youngest bond in the blend. Just a, a little bit on, on rum maturation, which is a very complex uh, subject in itself. Um, if you put it in the barrel, and most barrels used are the are ex bourbon barrels. Occasionally, you will see other other barrels around, but most of them are your ex bourbon barrels coming in um, in from the U.S. in their American oak. If you have high alcohol by volume into um, into your barrel 
you you tend to accent your heavier components and flavors coming coming out if you go in fairly weak into your um, barrel you tend to leach your esters and phenols so again that is why we generally choose an aging strength 60 to 65 percent somewhere in there it, it seems to be a very good compromise for aging strength but some people on purpose do age it stronger or or weaker because it does give them some different flavors for their blend um, aging at higher alcohol content obviously contributes to evaporation losses evaporation losses in the caribbean uh, can be very high uh, first and second year you can lose 10 10 percent of the alcohol in the barrel to evaporation losses that is not uncommon one thing that is interesting if you age your rum in a very dry climate the alcohol in percent in the barrel will tend to increase if you age it in a very in a humid place the alcohol content in the barrel percentage will tend to decrease um, as i said earlier chemical reactions can occur much faster in warmer weather so like i said as far as a chemical reaction concern is concerned uh, a one-year-old spirit aged in Barbados uh, would be equivalent chemical wise to one that's been aged three years or so in, a, in Scotland or somewhere like that. So again, the temperature of aging as well as the temperature of fermentation is quite important. As you can see, there's a lot of changes that happen during your maturation. But as you can see, uh, particularly with your color and your solids, most of that occurs in your first six months. It occurs very rapidly and then flattens out actually more than these curves show. They, those flattens out. Um, esters, most of, your, uh, most of your esters actually come from your fermentation and distillation, but we do get a lot of esters from the, the wood alcohols, et cetera, which add complexity. These are grow roughly, at, and that's rate of a chemical reaction. Tannins, again, largely in your first six months after that, they flatten out the, the same with the acids. So again, what you want to age, it depends on, on what you what spirit you're actually trying to produce. So here's the impact of aging in your, in your cask or barrel. And there's, there's a lot happening here. And I'm, there's a lot of information on this slide and I'm not gonna go over totally with you, but some of it I will describe. Obviously water evaporates out, so does alcohol, it comes out through the barrel. So things get concentrated. Your bigger molecules generally get concentrated in the spirit in the barrel. The evaporation loss of your alcohol and other low boiling compounds. In barrel reaction, uh, you get oxidation, oxygen coming in from here. You get ester formations, uh, extracted wood components, um, flavor compounds that evolve with wood components work, working with the spirits and other congeners that are present in the spirits. Again, a lot of very complex reactions going on here. That's why it is very, very important to choose a good barrel if you're aging and take care of your barrels. Um, I've seen a lot of good spirit ruined by putting it in a poor quality barrel. Um, the, but the other part of the equation is, if you put poor spirit into a barrel, 
it doesn't become good spirit. You need to put in good spirit into the barrel and let it age properly. You get additive effects of flavors, um, sugars, and particularly with American oak, vanillin, uh, tannins, color, lignin. Lignin is extremely important component in, in this whole uh, maturation process because it is a precursor for a lot of the other flavors that develop during the maturation process. And that comes from the toasting of the barrel before it's charred. And then you get your removal effects. Uh, sulfury notes are removed, cereal notes, other things get removed by this aging process. So if you're making an, an aged spirit, pay a lot of attention to your aging process. And if you are using smaller, smaller barrels, be very, very careful that you, you end up with a balanced spirit. Uh, smaller barrels can get definitely overwhelmed sometimes with these effects uh, before that some of these effects and these effects reach their ideal stage. So again, aging is a balancing act. Take care of it. Uh, thank you. I hope this presentation has been useful to you. And I think Maurice now, my counterpart, is going to be here to answer some questions. Thank you very much.